So the people in the room, let me just describe a little bit. You've already said hi to Lara Marks, uh, John Acompra, Lena Gopal here, waving, they were. And, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, we're just going to get started. I'd like to introduce, Fred is gonna be reading the paper or giving presentation typing. or typing <laughs> simultaneously. Uh, and so uh, he, he is a professor of English at the University of California, Riverside, and he's also author of In the Break, The Aesthetics of the Black Radical Tradition, uh, and also books of poetry, Houston's Tavern and B. Jenkins, um, published by, well, Leon Works for the first, Duke University Press the second, the Field Trio, uh, and also co-author with Stefano, uh, Stefano Harney uh, of The Undercommons, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, Minor Compositions, auto, uh, that's the Autonomedia Publishing. Uh, and his current projects include two critical texts, uh, Consent Not to Be a Single Being, <laughs> forthcoming from Duke University Press and let's see, anime, Animechanical Flesh, which extend his study of black art and social life and a new collection of poems, The Little Edges. So um, I'm going to turn this presentation over to Fred Moten and welcome Fred. Thanks for being here. Okay. <laughs> hey everybody, it's a pleasure to to almost be there, um, and uh, uh, can you hear me? Okay, um, I I'm gonna read a something to you. Uh, I, I ordinarily I would I always have this desire not to read in front of a bunch of people. It just seems so wrong, but um, but usually my fear overcomes my uh, resolve to not do wrong. So, and in front of a group of folks like you, I just didn't want to come unprepared. Um, anyway, so I'm going to start, and uh, it's it's about eleven pages, um, and and I've got sort of three epigraphs or sort of guiding ideas, and they all come from Adorno's aesthetic theory. So I'm going to start by reading these three passages, and hopefully you'll see how they relate to what it is that I'm going to try to say. Uh, the first is uh, from page, well, the first is this. The inner consistency through which artworks participate in truth always involves their untruth. In its most unguarded manifestations, art has always revolted against this. And today, this revolt has become art's own law of movement. And the second is a kind of variation on that. Um, and it says, Artwork's paradoxical nature, stasis, negates itself. The movement of artworks must be at a standstill and thereby become visible. Their imminent processual character, the legal process that they undertake against the merely existing world that is external to them, is objective prior to their alliance with any party. And then the third um, is this. To survive reality at its most extreme and grim, artworks that do not want to sell themselves as consolation must equate themselves with that reality. Radical art today is synonymous with dark art. Its primary color is black. Much contemporary art is irrelevant because it takes no note of this and childishly delights in color. Okay. So this is what I have. Alexandre Coré writes that in order to understand Copernicus's revolutionary significance, a turn or a return to the orientation that held man at the center is required. That return must be multiply propelled. He writes, to the force of visual evidence must be added that of the threefold teaching and tradition of science, philosophy, and theology, as well as the threefold authority of calculation, reason, and revelation. Only then shall we be capable of fully appreciating the incomparable daring of Copernican thought, which tore the earth from its foundations and launched it into the heavens. That daring is understood by Claret to have resulted in, in quote, 
a work which involved the destruction of a world that everything, science, philosophy, religion, represented as being centered on man and created for him. The collapse of the hierarchical order, which placing this sublunary world in opposition to the heavens, nonetheless united them by this very opposition." End quote. Black study is similarly concerned with the radicalization of the Earth's foundations. It is concerned with the destruction of the world. At stake is the necessity of an authentic eccentricity whose focus is on seeing the Earth at the end of the world, which entails the collapse of the hierarchical order that man erected in order to replace the one Copernicus shattered. That order sought to establish man's dominion over an Earth that had just been moved, thrown, radically decentered. Black study understands race and racism, and more specifically anti-blackness, as a failed geology meant to compensate for an already failed cosmology, a way of centering Europe in or on the decentered Earth, a violent reduction offered in order to save the phenomenon of world itself. This implies a certain deviance from Copernicus and towards the notion that the very idea of world as such and not just the medieval world and its extension of the ancient world is an, anthropocent is an anthropocentric fantasy. Racism has and is a cosmological function. The idea of world undergirds the notion of a human universe. The idea of race undergirds the idea of world. Black study ends up returning to the cusp of modernity's regulatory narrowing in order to lay more powerfully explosive and destructive charges in the various creases that score modernity's intellectual structures. Those faults are ancient and medieval, too, so that we extend while also deviating from Claret's notion that modernity breaks away from the continuities that link the ancient and the medieval. Black study attempts to instantiate a more radical break from the complex that is given in the extension of the ancient medieval by and in the modern postmodern, recognizing that these periods are, in the end, aggressive and accelerative markers of a profound spatial aggression, the ongoing attempt to establish an imperium, that megalomaniacal sovereignty that Europe seeks ultimately to command and possess. Hortense Spiller speaks of the reduction of body to flesh, echoing the discourse on slavery that speaks of a reduction of man to thing. And this reduction bears a kind of affinity or stands in a kind of proximity to ein Klammerum, epoche, the eidetic reduction of and in phenomena, phenomenology, which posits the inaccessibility of the real thing and brackets it, setting aside the question of the real existence of the contemplated, imagined, or more precisely imaged object, and questions concerning its physical or objective nature in the interest of a meditation upon the act of imaging itself. Here's how Husserl derives from Kant. And if the sense of the inaccessibility of the real thing is doubled by a sense of its valuelessness, which turns out to be nothing other than a presumed and absolute susceptibility to being valued, its emptiness, its lack of volitional force, then its suppression, enclosure, forgetting, and or ontological estrangement is even more intensely accomplished. But our work posits the animation of the thing. We discover that animation by way of a radical, delusional empiricism. So the problem is how to overcome this reduction of body to flesh, as Spiller thinks it, while recognizing, as she also says, that flesh is first, that it comes before body. Moreover, the problem is how to resist both the reduction of body to flesh that posits incorrectly the body's priority while also combating eidetic reduction as a philosophical method that, for all intents and purposes, redoubles the fictive assertion of body, object, idea, image, as what Spillers calls primary narrative. The method, the thing of black study, which continually discovers the animation of the thing as paraontological fugitivity, which is and is comported towards the animaterial, as anaphenomenological increase, a kind of anarepresentational increment. The hard thing is that the flesh's animation is in its aeration, in its differentiation, exposure, flight, and or flaying. 
Moreover, the method or thing is bound to the moral problematic of negative desire. Can we want not to be subjects? Can we want not to be sovereign? How to want not to be self-determining and self-protective? How to want not to be a self? The animation of flesh of the material does not bespeak the priority of the word. This is a problematic rather of the displacement of the gospel of according to John's displacement of Genesis. It is more generally the displacement of Genesis, the mobilization and radicalization of the generative, the evasion of each and every natal occasion, such occasion being in any case a patrimonial affair that we don't have time to mourn that constitutes the general economy and socialization of maternity. Flesh is the anaphenomenological supplement, augmentation in the break of the cut. Flesh is not spoken. Flesh is not imaged. Flesh is sung, flown, flung, thrown, danced, bumped, vogued, fused. And it's unclear what this has to do with cinema. What if the body itself is the ultimate tight space, the subject's constitutive prison, whose redoubling sovereignty requires? This is a Daniel Goldman, Samuel Delaney, George Lewis kind of question. The question concerning that from which the interplay of contact and improvisation escapes as hapticality, logisticality. The body is the whole, flesh is the shift. And so we move by way of an analytic of the tight space into a vernacular and parochial poetics of the non-space, what Nathaniel Mackey refers to as habitable indent, housed as well as unhoused vacuity, fecund recess, the atopic field of our sociality. I want to gesture towards uh, this more fully in a minute, um, this poetics or this method, which is what Spillers isolates under the rubric of empathy. Everything moves by way of this unbridgeable gap, this impossible bridge, this impassable cesura that separates and joins available, penetrable flesh and empathy. What does cinema have to do with flesh that overflows the body's regulation of it? With overflown flesh, with empathy in and as consent not to be a single being. Rubbed flesh, memory, feel, in representing the absence of empathy, 12 years a slave is, an, is utterly devoid of empathy. And, and I have to say that everything I've been thinking about movies for the past six months is under the shadow of that film, which I have to just be frank and say that I think is like risible. So I hope I'm not offending anybody up in there. Um, I know I got some friends who tend to want to agree with me. So, um, but I, you know, I don't want to make anybody too mad anyway. Um, but as I'm saying, 12 Years a Slave is utterly devoid of empathy. It might even be said to bring to a close the cinematic century's long and brutal experiment, beginning with 12 Years a Slave's vile mirror image and imaging of the desire for sovereignty, the birth of a nation. It brings to an end the cinematic century's long and brutal experiment with the liquidation of empathy by way of its reduction to the wan sentiment that attends to simultaneous exaltation and shaming of the subject, given in the co-present futility and brutality of the image. So that, that's the first part. Um, I should say this has three parts, so here's the second. Ever since its publication, um, when I try to think or talk about cinema, I have to do so by way of Kara Keeling's amazing book, The Witch's Flight, The Cinematic, The Black Femme, and The Image of Common Sense. In the scholarly care and aesthetic sensitivity of her analyses of particular films and filmic motifs, and above all in her brilliant construction of a theoretical paradigm, complex and supple enough to do justice to the interarticulate nature of two problems or projects, the cinematic and the color line, that can now, after her work, be more properly understood as, and not just as being of, the 20th century. Keeling offers In the Witch's Flight, a truly original work with which scholars across a range of disciplines need to contend with the severe kind of pleasure that attends the unavoidable call 
to rethink one's own certainties, desires, and visions. Early on, Keeling offers this description of her book. She writes, if it can be said, however enigmatically, that to think is always to follow the witch's flight, then the black femme is the witch whose flight the present book pursues in the name of thinking. Keeling takes up Deleuze's and Guattari's formulation concerning thinking, that it is the witch's flight, and extends a kind of counter trajectory of thought that Deleuze in particular outlines and for which he is a touchstone. More particularly, she deploys a notion of the cinematic, which extends Deleuze's elaboration of cinema in order to desig quote, designate a condition of existence or reality produced and reproduced by and within the regimes of the movement image and the time image, end quote. Her notion of a cinematic moves, again, this is a quote, a complicated aggregate of capitalist social relations, sensory motor arrangements, and cognitive processes, and as such makes possible an analytic of the world, the new reality the cinema could be said to have made or perfected. In particular, in particular, Keeling is concerned with elucidating what she calls the workings of the cinematic, and the cinematic process is integral to contemporary racism, sexism, and homophobic violence. For Keeling, the cinematic is not simply the field wherein the variety of technological apparatuses for the mechanical reproduction or electronic transmission of objects as images takes place in a manner that has come to be regarded as exemplary or paradigmatic. Rather, she writes, cinematic processes govern in the sense of exercising continuous sovereign authority over the selection of which images can appear and of what is likely to be perceptible in their appearance. They designate a specific perceptual schema that is adequate to the task of perceiving those images, a perceptual schema that corresponds to a matter that is itself cinematic, used here as an adjective to designate that which has to do with movement images and time images. Neither cinematic perceptual schemas nor cinematic matter precede the other. Together, they constitute the cinematic as an assemblage that might be referred to as 20th century reality." End quote. If Keeling's elaboration of a cinematic as the aggregate of capitalist social relations, sensory motor arrangements, and cognitive processes that make up 20th century reality leads her to engage and extend the Deleuzean philosophical line, then her particular interest in those cinematic processes integral to racism, sexism, and homophobia prompt her to turn to Fanon. The frame of Fanon's interventions on race and vision is, in my opinion, Du Boisian, and Keeling moves to understand the cinematic, i.e. 20th century reality, in its relation not only to its problem, which is, according to Du Bois, the color line, but to the very structure of the philosophical problem as such, as well as to the unequal labor that Blacks are called upon to do in the establishment and disestablishment of the problem in the particular historical context in which Keeling is interested, as well as in its general structure. The problem of the 20th century, which is to say the problem of the cinematic, is the color line. But the enactment or representation or performance of that problem the complicated task wherein being that problem converges with standing in for, representing or performing the problem as such, is the task for the black who is perceived of as the problem by the white and who is subject to an internalization of that perception that marks his own ontological opacity. Between Deleuze and Guattari, Du Bois and Fanon, Keeling discovers and cultivates rich theoretical ground in which the existence and the non-existence, the being and the being problematic, the Heideggerian throneness of Black people fully emerges in and as the 20th century, in and as the cinematic. Her movements follow a tortuous intellectual path, from the Fanonian assertion and critical analysis of the fact of Blackness, to Fanonian skepticism about the Black's very existence. From that skepticism in the service of the emergence of a new human, to ever more severe Althusserian and post-Althusserian skepticisms about the human, to a modified Gramscian understanding of common sense that's grounded in a kind of Marxist humanism. Keeling's theoretical flight is, however, 
always guided by a practical question whose implications must also be considered. The question is how to read the negative black imago that is ineluctably conditioned by attentive recognition. This is to say that the work offers something like a critique of recognition and the desire for recognition, given that both are determined by that Fanonian historicity wherein, quote, the set of past images of blacks, colonial constructions like tom-toms, immorality, cannibalism, fetishism, that reside in each appearance of the black, are the only accessible content of the Black. What are the implications of a theory of the cinematic that emerges from the critique of the negative image? This question is no less pertinent because it is raised in relation to a theory that rigorously goes about the business of a critique of certain under-theorized assertions about recognition and its supposed relation not just to the very idea of or desire for a positive image, but to the vast range of effects and investments that attend the aesthetics and the politics of representation. Insofar as she is interested in illuminating the interplay of what is corrosive and conservative in recent cinematic excursions into black imaging, excursions that have no choice but to partake in the vexed history and historicity of the black imago, Keeling's readings emerge from the same motivations and partake of the same structure of a long line of critiques of the negative image of the Black. At the same time, her work is brilliant in questioning the very idea, the very possibility, not only of a positive image, but of the referentiality that is supposed to link object and image. Instead, again by way of Deleuze, Keeling's analyses reveal what is hidden in the image, recover what has been removed from the image in order to make it interesting, and in so doing, allows us to discern the relation between what is hidden in and removed from the image and what is, in her words, expunged from the human in order to make it cohere. The complex of what is hidden and expunged from the image and from the human is what concerns Keeling. That complex is precisely the convergence of the figure of the black femme in her embeddedness in and defiance of the historical and political economic constraints that have constituted contemporary globalization's emergence from slavery and colonialism, and the underground common sense, sensibility, and sensuality within which that fugitive figure takes flight. Though the notion of a, of a taking flight within the underground might seem strange or improbable to those who haven't had the pleasure of reading Keeling's work, I can assure you that her work makes such seeing possible. Moreover, what is hidden in the image what has been expunged from the image returns as what Du Bois might have called the sudden rise at a given tune. Reinstantiating instantiating the richly striated field of black cinema as a sensual undercommons that demands in its eruption a seeing, a theorizing that is given to or taken by the hesitation of listening. This is to say that Keeling's work puts new flavor in your eye and ear insofar as she makes certain films show up differently and more essentially than they had before. This is, in turn, to say that Keeling's work moves as if it had been required by the films, as well as by the general historical problematic to which she has turned her attention, which is the highest compliment that I can give. So this is the last part. Okay. I wanted to proceed by way of Keeling because now that we have turned into another century, it is important to consider if we have turned as well into another problematic. In other words, do we remain in the cinematic or have we moved to some other realm beyond its boundaries? Or would it be more precise to say that rather than migrating from the cinematic, we have submitted the cinematic itself to a kind of migration? Perhaps the interplay of cinema and migration insofar as it constitutes a destabilization of both those terms, and in the aftermath of the century whose essential problematic is the color line, allows us to consider that what it is that we have learned to call the 20th century is itself an imago, deeper still a gross effigy and simulacrum, simulacrum of a structure that not only destabilizes the timeline, but the color line as well. If the color line is a geometric and geographical effect of black bodies, as if those bodies were the literal mark 
corresponded to the metaphorical legibility of the measurement and writing of the world, then what happens when we fully come to grips with, black, with the black body's non-existence in the flesh as the radical facticity of blackness? Then, perhaps, that political, economically determined interplay of object and image that structures and defines the cinematic is itself displaced in the fleshly, frame-breaking performance of thinking things. To come to grips with, if not to grasp, to touch or touch upon the haptic in cinema is, of course, to move by way of Laura Marx's path-breaking work, The Skin of the Film, which is the other book I have to consult whenever I try to think about cinema. And in a way similar to Laura's encounter with Alois Regal, we are all but immediately concerned with the necessity of piercing Regal's assumptions regarding the impenetrability of the object. More precisely, we are allowed and enabled to think against the grain not only of impenetrability, but also of objects, even in their resistance, as such resistance is said to instantiate, finally, some hard, residual, and irreducible discreteness. The thing's fleshliness is given in its penetrability, um, in its radical and irreducible availability, another word for which Hortense Spiller says, in an absolutely remarkable moment in AJ's latest film, Dreams Are Colder Than Death, which I think y'all just saw, um, after an all but interminable pause, as if out of the depths of an unbridgeable break, is empathy. That, that moment where she's talking about the availability to flesh, I and mean, then there's this amazing break, and she just says, another word for it is empathy. What if the non-existence, which is established in and as resistance of the black body, of the black object, which is lived, which is to say thought in the flesh, is understood either as that whose elaboration constitutes either the end or the violent and involuntary displacement of the cinematic? What if blackness, whose facticity in instantiating impenetrability's fictiveness by way of a substantiality that simultaneously materializes and disperses the image, renders logical positivism and phenomenology equally inadequate terms, uh, equally inadequate, turns out to have thrown off the cinematic as an epiphenomenal bank or barrier whose presence is a means by which we return, as Nam Chandler would say, by way of the Du Bois that only his reading gives us to the problem of the centuries. Blackness, which in its in untimely homelessness confers the gift of cinema, takes cinema away in its fleshly and in sovereign accompaniment to the screen, in its constant deconstructive and reconstructive supplements to the apparatus. What I'd like to be able to describe under duress in privation by way of an overabundantly poor critical poiesis is what it is to be discovering a new art form without producing. I'm interested in the plan in progress, something Laura Harris gets at most emphatically in her work on Elia Oitasika and CLR James. I'm interested in an esthesis of the plan when cinema is being forced to go somewhere to become something other than what it is. When Adorno, in typically curmudgeonly fashion, says that jazz is not what it is, he utters a prophecy for cinema that emerges from his insights into, or perhaps it would be more precise to say his feelings regarding the danger of art or black art. In the work of Rene, AJ, and John, and Lena, cinema is not what it is. They, and we, insofar as we watch them and watch with them, have gone through cinema or are now making cinema go through something else, go through some rich combination of regeneration and degeneration, claiming an internal diversity in cinema, in the cinematic, that constitutes cinema's divergence from itself in and as the draft, the generative and degenerative reproductivity of the non-produced or the not fully produced, the non-work or outwork or mad work, the twerked, the turk, the torqued, the forked, the multiply tongued, the broken tongued and broke down, broke out, uncorralled corral, and a cinematic symposium, and a cinematic practice, a monastic cinematic breaking of rule. Each in their several ways allow and require us to consider that the logic of freedom and constraint 
which is where one is always tempted to think film is hell, where one is tempted to believe that the essential relation between blackness and cinema is located, is actually itself disrupted by blackness as irregularity. That the relation between micro-intonation and temporality is given in blackness as the relation between precision and impurity. Can cinema affect the mobilization and differentiation of what AJ calls the abnormative against the force of normativity? What if blackness in its irreducible maternity and its ineluctable queerness moves outside the systemic opposition of normative and non-normative? What if we consider blackness to be or to instantiate the prehistory of the post-cinematic? Then the new improvisational age of moved, migratory, more and less than cinematic practice is here. Oh, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. So that was beautiful. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to open this up to questions and, uh, or comments, uh, conversation while you're here. Uh, so if anybody has anything, the mic is here. I have a question. <laughs> Who has a question? Yeah, I have a question. I just want yeah, 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 yeah. What's what's it's your just, question? <laughs> it's just hard to be in this non-position, you know. But <laughs> usually, when I'm there, when I'm present, I can, I get like some kind of feeling of whether or not anybody knew what I was trying to talk about. So, but I have no idea if anybody knows what I was trying to talk about. So, does anybody know what I was trying to talk about? <laughs> And it's not your fault if you don't know. It would be totally my <laughs> fault. I felt like I did. <laughs> okay. All right. Then. Now I feel better. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Uh, oh, I, I think you were uh, corroborating what AJ was saying this morning. Um, so, uh, because uh, in, your, in your different ways, you're both talking about having to... Um, um, make the uh, the apparatus uh, super bad in order to push through it. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. That's one thing I thought you were saying. So I, I don't have a question for you, but yeah, I, I think some of us uh, felt we understood what you were talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want to thank you so very much for bringing Hortense Spillers together with the skin of the film, and I I really agree about. Um, uh, that bre breaking down bodies in, uh, or the discreteness of bodies is a first step of empathy. But empathy is a very uh, dangerous thing because you, you know, it, can be very, um, uh, it can be very dangerous to lose yourself to that degree. Could you say something about that? Yeah, it, it's definitely, I agree with you that it's dangerous. Um, it's scary, I guess, would be maybe, yes, I mean, it, well, yeah, it's dangerous and scary. It's dangerous insofar as it does, in fact, constitute um, the opening towards a kind of violence to self that is probably um, uh, irresistible, um, from which the self can't recover. Um, and so it's dangerous and it's scary insofar as we move within a kind of a general commitment that I don't know that any of us can opt out of, um, at least on an individualized level. We move within this general commitment to self. Um, so it's dangerous and it's scary, but at the same time, it seems to me totally, totally necessary, um, absolutely necessary. And, and that's what seems to me is captured so uh, beautifully in that passage, you know, in AJ's film when Spillers is speaking, because she's speaking out of the pain and the terror of this absolute availability and, and penetrability um, that she talks about in, in relation to the flesh. Um, 
but she also is speaking from the perspective, I believe, of, of a recognition of the absolute necessity um, that attends this, uh, this, this possibility that, that the experience of flesh makes, gives us. Um, so yeah, it's dangerous and scary, I agree. But, but something that it feels like, to me at least, is absolutely necessary for us to claim. Okay, I want to ask another question. Oh. Hey, uh, Fred. Uh, so I got a question <laughs> for you, hey. uh, AJ. Uh, What's up, man? I keep, I keep thinking uh, he can see us, too. Oh. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think I'm just going to stay here. We can see you, though. <laughs> I can we, hear you. We observing you very closely. <laughs> Your every smallest little expression. <laughs> so you can't hide. I'm going to ask you this question now that you cannot hide. <laughs> so this is something that's kind of come up a couple of times just in our conversations that I think is related to some of the stuff that you talked about. I... Uh, I, I think I even said to you once, hey, man, I want you to spell it. I want you to, uh, you know, make, say explicitly, talk about this. Oftentimes when I talk about, you know, objectives, specific objectives for black cinema, I'll talk about the subject. Even when we talk about 12 Years a Slave, I'll say, you know, what I'm trying, what I'm actually trying to do is to figure out how to create a richer subject, you know, or how, like, in 12 Years a Slave, I feel like, you know, you have people pause between being subjects and objects. And you oftentimes, consistently I've heard you say, yeah, but that's the whole problem. We just want to get past the whole subject thing all together. So can you, uh, you know, talk about or uh, elucidate this whole idea of, uh, of uh, black cinema and being post-subject, I guess, in a sense. Subject and object simultaneously. Like, what's the problematic with the subject? as a mode of, uh, you know, of inquiry and a mode of uh, renovation inside of black cinema, as you understand it. Yeah, well, some of it has to do with just, um, okay, so, it strikes me that the subject is, um, is impossible and partly, and, and one way to, to talk about the reason for that impossibility is that the subject only fully comes into his own in, in, in sovereignty and, and as sovereignty. Um, and that's not, and that's, that's, sovereignty is unsustainable in that way. So, so we're all operating within this sort of general impossibility. And one way to think about it is that the subject oscillates between the dream of its exaltation into sovereignty and the shame that attends every constant realization, every moment of the constant realization that that dream of exaltation is, is unfulfilled and unfulfillable. So the, the subject oscillates between exaltation and shame, right? And this to me, I mean, I'm, I don't mean to pick on it. I mean, I do mean to pick on it. But to me, this is Steve McQueen's thematic, right? That's what his films are always about, all of them, okay? Is this constant neurotic oscillation between exaltation and, and shame, okay? Um, and, and you could argue that in some general sense, cinema is in some ways always enacting that, that oscillation. It, this is in, in my view. Um, Sometimes that oscillation manifests itself as the interplay between movement and stasis. I mean, the cinematic apparatus, in a certain sense, almost requires that it operate itself in relation to that opposition. Um, so you see what I'm trying to say? Exaltation and movement, on the one hand, stasis or frozenness or having been captured, you know, the inability to move in its relation to shame on the other, okay? And so in a certain sense, you know, there's something essentially cinematic about 12 Years a Slave, okay? Um, and if the cinematic really is the 20th century, as Kara Keeling says, 
you know, then, and if the, you know, and if this complex between the cinematic, the color line and this, all this stuff, you know, there's something fundamental about 12 years of slave. It's, it, it's, it's, it's as if one would argue that it, it, you know, sort of, it had to be made, you know, but see, here's the, remember talking with you, AJ, you know, sometimes about the idea was that at one point you just said, well, I'm not trying to say that I wish the film had never been made. Remember? Okay. So what I'm saying is, I do wish the film had never been made. So on the one hand, I'm acknowledging both the absolute necessity of its having been made insofar as it is genuinely and ir irreducibly of the cinematic and of the 20th century. That this is a film which had to be made, but it's a film which I wish, wish hadn't been made. Now, one further elaboration of this, and this is what I'm trying to get at by way of this notion of practice, and this is also something which, for me, definitely comes from the experience of just talking with you, AJ, in particular, about your practice, and particularly about Apex, right? Is I'm interested in what the relationship is or what the difference is between the film that I wish hadn't been made but which had to be made and the film which is not going to be made. Okay. And see, part of what I'm interested in is the is that what I'm talking about under the rubric of the Anna cinematic is so much bound up with a, a new kind of, you could call it post-cinematic practice, which I feel like I've had been privy to just from hanging out with you talking around our, our dinner table or talking on the phone when I was in North Carolina, where I feel like we were actually you know, that I was actually allowed to be proximate to a practice of movie making or of filmmaking that wasn't predicated on the actual, on the actual finished object of the film itself, right? And in this respect, what you were doing constituted a mode of contact improvisation that we would associate maybe with dance or with the, the music, you know, or with other kinds of performative modes. And that's what I mean when I say that there's a way in which it accompanies, but it also breaks the frame. It breaks the screen, right? That, that apex exists not as a finished object, but it exists within this, con com within this rich, complex, dispersed conversation, right? As a kind of monastic, meditative practice of black study that you have, been, that you have initiated and begun to think through. And to me... That's more important because what because at that point the practice of cinema independent of the cinematic object corresponds to how it is that we might move in a mode of personhood that's independent of the impossible object of the self itself. Um, so that's that's my answer to the question. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, is there a way in which we can see the desire of an ossified negative desire as able to create this animation that you speak of that is an antidote to eidetic reduction, right? So is there a way in which that desire of negative desire can create the animation of which you, of which you speak? That's the question. I think so. I mean, I, I feel like when I when I ask the question, can we want not to be a subject? Can we want not to be a self? I, the, the, I, you know, implied there, implied is the answer to the question, which is yes. And and that yes answer is not a function of theoretical speculate it's not just a function of theoretical speculation it's also a function of 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 of, of experience it, it's an empirical formulation that 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 we have lived this right i mean that there's a way to not <laughs> i mean i'm teaching this class on afro-american literature up through the harlem renaissance we didn't even really get to the harlem the last book we're reading is the marrow of tradition by charles chestnut and it seems to me that 
there's all these interesting ways in which inadvertently, against the grain of his own desire, Chestnut is constantly constrained to represent, right, you know, his his experience or the his sort of main character, Dr. Miller's experience of a range of folks who appear not to really have as their first concern becoming subjects, right? Um, so we, I think that we, you know, the question is, you know, how do you, how do you pay attention to that? You know, how do you look at that? You have to look at it outside of normative conceptions of value. You know, you have to develop a way of seeing, in other words, and, and that's not even right. It's not so much that you or one or we or a certain kind of intelligentsia has to develop a way of seeing that other mode of life. We have to figure out ways to attend to the ways in which that other mode of life sees, which is to say theorizes itself. You know, but we but I believe that we have access to that. Um and I believe that um yeah, I, yeah anyway. So. I'm fine. And I'm like uh, Morpheus, you know, my beliefs do not require that you believe in my, you know. <laughs> Fred, John Okumfra, I just want to pick your brains for a minute on something. Uh, okay. Hey, um, John. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm good. How you doing, man? As I say, Nigeria, I day. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's to do with three, three tantalizing moments in your presentation for me that I just want to push a little further with you if you don't mind and they're to do with three categories the the Copernican post-human and post-cinema um, see I mean I, I agree with you absolutely on on using the idea of the Copernican shift as a as a metaphor for understanding the inauguration of cinema itself and I you know for me the term which we've been using more and more is the Promethean gesture of cinema. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, now, it seems to me that if you accept a proposition, uh, the delusion proposition, that the cinema is characterized by a kind of movement, then it seems to me you could also accept the notion of migration as an organizing motif for that project. Mm -hmm. And so if things can migrate into the space of the cinematic, they can also leave it, mm -hmm. right? Which suggests to me the possibility of the post-cinematic. Now, we keep coming to this point, and then we pull back. And I just want you to see what you think about it for a minute. If 12 years is the final confirmation that, in fact, it will be impossible to realize all our desires through this form, then should we not simply call for the cinematic as the next phase for our practice? Now, that seems to me to be partly what you were saying about AJ's work anyway, but I just want to get you to talk about that for a minute, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, I, 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 yes, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I feel like we should. It's not just to, not just so much to call for, the the the, the Anna cinematic, but to but to answer the call that it already mm. emits mm. from the margins or the underground of the cinematic. Like for me, one of the things which is interesting about a film like Twelve Years and why it must, in some sense, be why I see it as the kind of complex mirror image of birth of a nation and and you know the, so that we can mark out this the 20th century in, in terms of its relation to the cinematic starts in 1915 and ends in 2013 seems to me but one of the reasons that um the things that's remarkable about both of those films but even more intensely remarkable about 12 years um for various reasons is that we see the Anna cinematic <laughs> constantly on the edge, in the edges, in the background, literally as the background against which the cinematic and, and its particular way of imaging the desire for sovereign subjectivity manifests itself, right? 
that 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 the Anna cinematic literally shows up as the backdrop against which that desire becomes, you know, visible for us or is imaged, you know, as scenery, um, you know, as as a kind of sound track, even as a kind of drone, so to speak, you know. So, um, so what's at stake is to see if it's possible to hear the call so of the the more the more and less than cinematic right as it is emitted you know from the margins of the cinematic in such a way as to allow us to move beyond those margins you know in in our own i shouldn't say our own you know but it, with, with in cinematic in in a, in a non or more and less than cinematic practice you know um so i i don't know if that really i hope that answers I mean, um, j just one more, and, and because this is something that's been coming at me all, all today. Um, um, see, it seems to me that if you accept that the post cinematic is is a default uh, available, that it was already always already in the mix, then. Part of our dilemma is is almost a Heideggerian one because the the flight to um, to the post cinematic then suggests giving up on some of the attachments to notions of sovereignty, which you know, which the you know, which cinema was about, you know, the subject, the gaze, uh, suggests giving up on some of those romantic assumptions. But the opposite is almost too frightening. So, you know, like one of the conversations AJ and I keep having is precisely about this. If you give up on the, on the cinematic and embrace the post-cinematic, it seems to me that you then find yourself somewhere between the space of alterity and the abject, in the absence of the superego of the cinema, right? So the question is then, what do you do in that space? Why, why would you want to have a set of rules which try to reinstitute the very romantic assumptions of cinema that you've just flown away from. You know what I mean? Like, why would you want to make, you know, so AJ is showing this piece, which is fantastic. It's four, four minutes long, um, and it has this great track. But it's announced as a rehearsal for, for something else. And I'm saying to myself, well, if the post-cinematic is to find itself with new obsessions, then that must be the work. There is no beyond, <laughs> you know. We kind of, I just, what do you think about that? Because it's been something that's been going through my head all day as I sat here listening to, to AJ today about the need for black cinema. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if one gives up on the cinema, I, and I don't mean give up, if one embraces the alternatives, which mm -hmm. are already in the mix, then, then, <laughs> Why do we need a black cinema anymore? You know what I mean? Yeah, no, and I, I guess what I'm, and again, I, I don't want to put, it's funny because I've, I feel like maybe we've been involved in this conversation together through, for me, AJ is at the heart of this thinking for me. Like I can't imagine thinking these thoughts without the experience of talking with AJ, even though I'm pretty certain that I'm probably saying some things that might be anathema to, to AJ, for which I apologize because I feel like almost certainly I must be wrong, okay? But, um, but I feel like I'm at the point now where, yeah, I, I really don't necessarily want to call for a black cinema. Um, I think that maybe these notions that black cinema is a kind of, is an oxymoron, you know? Um, that's what I've begun to move towards thinking. But at the same time, there is a kind of post or anti-cinematic practice, which I actually believe that you and AJ and Renee are already engaged in. Um, which for me, I associate with blackness, but 
I, or another way to put it is, I associate it with the most radical possible theorization that we could imagine of blackness. And I certainly know that it must be scary. It's easy for me, since so far as I'm not engaged in this practice, to 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 want to valorize it or lionize it. And I know it must be harder for y'all to actually engage in it because because its proximity to the norms of cinema are close and and also to the extent that you are in some sense you have to deal with it. You know, you have to deal with those norms. You have to live in in relation to those to those norms. So I I'm not I don't mean to take it lightly or to 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 take lightly this challenge. I just want to to register my excitement. You know, at at the ground you know, that, 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 that all of y'all are, are breaking um, and to see if it's possible to offer some kind of a description of it that marks what I think of as what's so invaluable about your breaking of that ground while at the same time always having to acknowledge that it must be absolutely difficult, like beyond difficult, like beyond impossible to be in the position of, of having to break that ground. Thank you. But there's a but there's something afoot. Don't you think? I mean, there's like no, I, I agree. mean, whatever, you know. There's a, something else is going on. And it's got to go on, you know. I just want to <laughs> I want to respond a little bit. Um I think uh you know, look, I just like I always gravitate towards people who I think are smarter than me, basically. <laughs> You know, I would place Fred in that category, John for sure, and certainly Greg as well. Um, but I, I uh, you know, and it is a little terrifying. I mean, it's, I'm less terrified by the theoretical, what I would call the theoretical or the hypothetical parts of it, and more concerned by the pragmatic parts of it, like, you know, what the fuck am I doing, kind of. Um, this whole idea of black cinema for me is a bit of a, um, a lodestone or something like that now. I don't know, it's like, I wrote this essay, <laughs> Greg sort of twisted my arm to write this thing, My Black Death, and uh, and I remember telling him, like, he said, but you said this a million times, just write it down. I said, oh, it's really hard for me to do that because I, you know, I said, I think it's still true, but I'm not sure if I believe it anymore, you know? It's just a convenient, North Star kind of idea for me. And I was thinking about something that Greg said earlier today when we were talking about a friend, uh, Scott Post and Brian, and he said, uh, you know, uh, that uh, there's no, there, there are no homosexuals, they're just homosexual acts. I kind of feel like the black cinema I'm imagining is a little like that. Mm -hmm. it's, no, it's not really any black cinema, it's just black cinema acts. And what to me black cinema acts are, are the ongoing process of trying to figure out because ultimately, it's not about cinema. I, you know, I used to tell myself, I have the same preoccupations that I had when I was studying architecture or when I think about painting, whatever, right? Which is this whole idea, if black aesthetics are both immaterial and concrete at the same time, then if it is an Im immaterial thing, the way we demonstrate its concreteness is by seeing how it moves through specific uh, apparatus, uh, whether it be architecture. So when I was in architecture, I would have said, what would kind of blue look like if it was a house? What would electric lazy land look like if it was a, a building? So in a sense, the cinema, as much as I'm invested in cinema per se, I want to go and see images that move around and stuff. Fundamentally, I think what I'm trying to do is to demonstrate, it's almost like Jay-Z and them said, we're going to demonstrate the superiority of street knowledge or something like that. It's like I'm trying to demonstrate the concreteness of this most immaterial thing, which is a set of philosophical values which are situated in the NATO context, Africa, but have been completely reformulated in the context of the Americas, have been completely reformulated and free fall in a sense. It's like, how do we make things that are manifestations of that which it is very difficult to speak about because of, as you say, its fugitivity and all these other kinds of things. How do we make that? But I'm also not prepared yet to give up on the thing that actually looks like a movie, per se, that people can go and sit in front of. Uh, you know what I mean? I feel like I still want to do both things. Like, for me, 
if I say Ape X as it exists now is a rehearsal for some avatar as big budget kind of movie, I'm still very interested in the idea that both of those things could possibly exist, that the existence of this other thing that I'm imagining, which in all likelihood won't, you know, won't happen, could still happen and could still be in an incredibly uh, rich tension with the place that I find myself operating out of no, you know, <laughs> out of necessity, for lack of a better, a better way to describe it. Well, okay, so basically that's, well, when I was talking about, when I, when I mentioned an Adorno or appeal to Adorno, it's just to say that that formulation that he makes in the sort of infamous essay on jazz, you know, so jazz is not what it is. Um, that's what, I mean, I think you could broaden it out if you wanted to and say something on the order of black music is not what it is. Okay. And I would say, I think uh, by way of analogy, you could say, make a similar formulation with regard to black cinema, that it is not what it is. Okay. Um, now, for me, that, that's, that's the highest compliment that one could give, you know, a, a, a body of art, let's say, uh, or a, a field of, of aesthetic endeavor or a field of aesthetic acts um, to say that it is not what it is. Um, the thing to me about... I mean, look, man, I... On a, on a, if as <laughs> you've already, I'll say to you what I said. I'll say to everybody what I said to you, and I really truly meant it. That if I if I ever hit the Mega Millions lottery, I'd give seventy five percent of the money to you in the hopes that you could make Apex, right? And then I give a whole chunk of it to everybody else in that room to see what y'all could do. You know, whatever. Um. So it's not that I'm trying to say. So when I so when I say that I have, so it, so that when I say that I believe that part of what's invaluable about Apex is that it can't be made in that way, in the way of the cinematic. That's not some vile and brutal wish that it not be made, okay. Um, in the same way that when I talk about the absolute necessity of 12 years a slave having been made is precisely all bound up with my wish that it had never been made, right? So it's, you know, Foucault says that madness is the absence of the work. And I always like want to try to twist it around a little bit and to talk about something like what might be called the madness of the work. Right, um, a kind of incompleteness of the work, or a kind of constant working and reworking of the work, right? That 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 operates precisely at the level of an interplay between the material and the immaterial, between the concrete, you know, and the and the and the animistic, let's say. So, and to me, like maybe to me, the closest, the 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 the. the the most sort of ubiquitous concretization of this, that, that particular paradoxical phenomenon is like the live recording, you know, the work that is not a work, the work that is more than a work, the work that is both more and less than a work. But, but to me, the work that is both more and less than a work corresponds precisely to that notion of jazz being other than what it is or black cinema being other than what it is which is again for me that's the highest possible compliment that one could pay. So what I so I guess what I'm trying to say is is that there's this there's this trend there's this transcendent there's this transcendence of the work that exists precisely as a function of the eminence of what's in the work that I see as being the common denominator that links the work that y'all do, 
And and that's what I guess I've been invested so much in trying to celebrate and also invested in trying to to help to evangelize in a certain way because it seems to me that that what it makes that that the things that it makes possible are so radical and so necessary. Okay, Fred. Let let's do it. <laughs> because I just realized this is the first time we've spoken AJ and I have spoken, Greg and AJ and I have spoken, me and Renee, but we've never done this together, you know, uh, or very rarely. And somehow, I don't know whether it's the energy of this coming together is sparking all sorts of thoughts and all manner of philosophers <laughs> jumping around at the moment. So um, just one more way of coming at this. Um, you know, so if the cinema is the superego, we leave the god of cinema and we're in the space of nihilism and we're wrestling with the question of what must be. The other figure who might be useful here um, by way of an injunction is Nietzsche. So Nietzsche says, you know, just sail. It's not a flat earth, you won't fall off. You know, maybe Apex really is the thing. You know, maybe what we need to embrace is the practice as we already have it and find other ways of valorizing it. Not because the effort to reach the promised land of cinema is impossible, it might be possible, but that if you got there, the act of trying to turn Apex, the working project, quote unquote, into this thing called Apex, the $75 million movie, would affirm exactly what McQueen's project has, which is that when you get to this point, it's the end. It's nothing can begin if you have to fit itinerant, you know, uh, what you're calling the untimely homelessness of our condition into something which says you must be that. You cannot not be, you have to be this as a conditions of existence. And I'm not sure that that price is worth paying anymore. You know what I mean? Like I'm not sure what the end result really amounts to if you do 15 years of great work as an artist and you end up with the work that finally tells everyone that cinema is over now, you know, I'm just not sure it's worth the price, you know? Um, I don't know, I don't know, just a thought. I'm just gonna add something to that because I feel like Ellison needs to be in the room and that is the value of hibernation. So there's a way in which I see the, um, the anacinematic, right, as hibernation, hibernation as preparation for covert action, right? So there's a way in which there's a value in the hibernation, right? And um, that's why I don't see Nietzsche so much as I see, you know, the possibility in hibernation, that hibernation can take the form of the acinematic, right? It's the lower frequencies. Like, what would it mean to, to value the basement <laughs> but, but, no, but just follow, let's just follow that to its logical conclusion, right? Why should it be hibernation? Why could it not be the place of habitus? Why can we not live in the basement? Why do we have to come out for another action? What is there beyond the, the, the basement? That's what I'm wrestling with at the moment. You know what I mean? Like, why do you need to come out? What's this... This... Uh, <laughs> As the, the basement as spa, right? As the place that you go to in order to be able to come back out, right? And maybe do the cinematic that, it, you know, that we might call like soul depleting cinematic, right? 
Uh, does that make sense? Makes sense. Yeah. I don't agree, but it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I don't agree either. Um, <laughs> hi, hi, Fred. It's Renee here again. Uh, okay. <laughs> so I mean, I just wanted to speak, uh, just think about this together. I think it's a good point that John made, and this has all been pretty intentional, uh, trying to put all of uh, our voices together in a room, even if you're virtually transmitted. Um, I think that as uh, people engage in producing work, uh, <laughs> as I just passed Greg, just saying, well, we've been in hibernation uh, long enough, actually. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. I think the ongoingness is an interesting thing to think about. Um, I feel very attuned to what you've been saying, uh, and I'm interested in that uh, also. I mean, it sort of sparked a number of ideas uh, that we've been in conversation about in different ways really during the past two years uh, of the launch of the project. And so um, I think that um, I, I still don't, I, I don't, don't want to throw in the towel uh, <laughs> for anything. And I'm not saying hi hibernation, maybe, you know, reflection, uh, you know, taking pauses or whatever, but I, I, I see it all as being connected. I don't really see it as, uh, I, I see that there can be so many different possibilities in various forms and ways of uh, continuing to think and make. I like what you were mentioning, though, about the completion aspect, in a way, if I'm uh, getting this. Uh, because the end isn't really something that's uh, in inviting. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that it's uh, what, w what we've been engaged in doing uh, is through the form, through the different forms themselves, been ways of um, manifesting and, and also thinking. And I think it's in part related to some of those Deleuzian ideas uh, in, in terms of an encounter, for example. And I think through some of the productions that, uh, I wish you were here so that you could see <laughs> some other things that we've made, like this most recent thing that we've made together um, here, uh, which we're going to be looking at pretty soon. So, anyway, um, I don't. I think that there's a limit to how many things you can be talking about. Actually, I think you can. You have to just throw yourself into it and watch uh, and make. So, anyway, I'm going to pass this back over across the room. Well, I, while you're passing, I just want to say I I feel. Um, I feel the, the lack of being present um, as something, you know, that's primarily my own, you know, misfortune. And I, I feel badly about that. I wish I were there. Um, I, I want to say I, that that, uh, that the word that I would maybe want to replace I, I'm totally committed to this notion of preparation, of, of a rehearsal, of literally of practicing, you know, of practicing our practice. It, it strikes me that I wouldn't call it hibernation, and I don't think of it as being nihilistic at all or, or even a surrender. Um, it's, it's maybe on the order of a disavowal, but it's not a surrender at all. Um, and if it's, if it's, if it's got to do with nothingness, it's got to do with a kind of absolute nothingness, you know, in a Zen kind of a sense, rather than the relative nothingness that we associate with nihilism in a kind of Western philosophical sense. But, but the thing is, is like, I feel like I'm happy to be pro to be in, in a, in a kind of proximity to this tremendous, you know, eruption of, of aesthetic and intellectual practice that I associate, at least to, to use the example that's been brought up, with the, with the making, with the ongoing practice of making Apex, right? That's what, and that's what I think of. And so it's not at all about ceasing or stopping to be, you know, no longer being engaged in that process of making, which one could 
talk about in heuristic terms as being oriented by or in relation to a certain notion of the cinematic. It's just that every experience I've had and every instance of being in proximity to this making, to this practice, is bound up with the simultaneity of its being both more and less than a conventional understanding of the cinematic. Do you know? That it, because on the one hand, it isn't made, it hasn't been made into a movie that we, you know, and on the other hand, if it ever, what it is now, and if it ever were made into what they would call a movie, it would be more than that. You know, it's already more than that. And whatever, and whatever manifestation it takes is always going to be more than that. So, you know, and in this respect, what it is and what it will be, to my mind, already constitutes the disavowal or the leaving behind of, of the cinematic um, in, in that narrow sense of that term. And it, and it constitutes that precisely insofar as what, we, what, is, what it is and what it, what it already is, is, is an instance or a series of instances of practice of rehearsal, of, of preparation, um, you know, uh, you know, so that in this respect, it, it, it's not, it's maybe not, you know, the invisible man's sort of underground hole. That's the, the sort of an analogous space to this, but like Minton's playhouse, you know, which to me was not a zone, was a zone, was a space of practice and, and sort of, secular, fleshly, monastic, you know, uh, intellectual activity, um, you know, um, and, you know, AJ and John and Renee, they bring mittens wherever they go. Like, <laughs> mittens is with them wherever they go, you know. They, AJ brings Minton into my house, you know. And, I was there when, when Renee brought Mintons to Duke University. I saw it, you know. Um, I was in what she brought, you see, so. Um. I just want I just want to put one more person like on the his because I feel like we we putting out a lot of names that are very useful in terms of thinkers and stuff, but a person who's really super valuable to me is Sylvia Winter, um, uh, really super important to me and just without actually can't do an overview of her thinking or anything, but this one notion she has is new forms of life, is very very important to me because I think you know foremost what new forms of life imply is new ways of living. And I do think about that in terms of like the kind of movies or film experiences that I want to have. You know, there's a way in which I guess it's exciting to think about Apex as it exists now as a, as a thing, you know, as an actual thing that's done and other people can experience it. But I guess it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's turned ratcheting it up. It's like what I'm very excited about is the possibility of bringing the set of uh, values, preoccupations, uh, exchanges, discourse to bear in a more, uh, in another context, a context, more money context for lack of a, <laughs> you know, a more, uh, um, maybe a more proper way of putting it. But there's a way I really just want to also see what it looks like, you know what I mean? With being able to mobilize more people's resources um, just to see, you know, just to see, just out of sheer curiosity. It's not like I'm even invested in Apex as a big feature film, because I do feel like for myself, as it exists now, as a slide projection or whatever it is, it's totally, it's one of the most, one of the maybe one or two most satisfying things I've ever done. I mean, I'm kind of more invested in making a movie about other things, you know what I mean? But I do feel like the whole challenge to me, and I sort of said this to Malik, you know, Saeed, who's been my primary sort of collaborator on it, is that it exists so that if we do ever find ourselves in a position to make a more, you know what I mean, a movie-like version of it to remind us 
of what kinds of intensities and other possibilities we would like to try to bring to that context as well as the context that it at present we exist in. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to uh, offer an alternative, Fred, to um, your, uh, your definition of the subject, because uh, I, I think it, um, it, makes, it makes the project that the uh, amazing filmmakers here are uh, undergoing seem um, uh, more impossible than it really is, this definition of a, a sovereign subject. Because you know, yesterday and today we've been uh, seeing and talking about fantastic films in which there's almost always um, like individuation happening. You know, there's a, there's a usually there's often a you know a group or a, or a historical memory and a um, somebody individuates from that and you you see them keeping on uh, becoming and transforming. We see that in black audio films. Yeah, Mancha Diawara talked about it yesterday as a, a becoming in their film Testament, but also, you know, back in the 80s, uh, Mancha was writing about African cinema as a collective cinema with a collective subject. And in the movies that, that you showed, AJ, they're, um, your, your own beautiful film were really plastically this um, kind of coming into a being of a subject is visible and audible. Um, and in other people's movies you showed, like that uh, uh, Chief Keef video, you know, we, we, we see all, all this kind of, this arising and becoming of subjects, and it's not that sovereign subject. I'm, everybody knows that's a fiction by now, except for like maybe Hollywood bank rollers. Um, so I just, I, I just want to say that, to say that we, we've been uh, seeing really strong examples of movies that do have subjects, but they're not this old, this old fashioned kind of all or nothing subjectivity. Do you have any comment, Fred? Oh, oh I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 yeah, and then uh, we're but talk. I have to say that you you are our subject today, Fred, because you're you're up there, you know, so much larger than life, and a, with a golden penumbra around you. You're like our our technologized god, and that's really great. Our penumbra. <laughs> well, I just want to announce my resignation. Then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but I, I mean. Can you can you still hear me? Yeah, we can we can okay, hear you. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm just. I mean, it's a long, you know, discussion, or, you know, that we would have to have. I I don't. I I could I would want to, if I had time to really think through it and write it down. I mean, that's not true. What I'm saying is, I've had time to really think through it and write down even what my objections would be to that sort of notion of becoming, you know, maybe in a way that, you know, certain kinds of philosophical thinking would want to establish it or, um, or individuation too, for that matter. It, it's, it's not that, I mean, I'm willing to, it's not like I'm so, don't want, I want to be so stringent that, uh, that these experiences that we might talk about under the rubric of becoming or individuation or let's say an individuated becoming, it's not that I want to just sort of deny these experiences or, or discount them. But what I do want to do, I suppose, is to displace the valorization of them or, or a certain kind of valorization of these experiences, which are attached to, to, to not only to, the notion of the priority of the individual, in my view at least, but also attached to, you know, the history of a certain thinking of the subject that even though we all know that the sovereign subject is impossible, we still orient ourselves in relation to that impossibility. 
so that it seems to me that it's not enough to just know that it's that it's impossible um and and then to celebrate let's say what shows up as that impossibility under the rubric of individuation or becoming it's also necessary to to see what um what the alternative to that impossibility actually is to see something that exists on the other side of what one might call the exhaustion of the both the possibility and the impossibility of the subject that's a really that's a really great point uh, to shift Fred that's great I, I'm sorry that you're not going to be here because we're actually going I could make a segue to what we're going to do next which mm. is to watch a film that we've made uh, together uh, <laughs> and so Anyway, um, it's been it's been fantastic being able to see you, uh, even though you can't see us so well, and uh, to just hear and exchange with you. So um, let's let's stay in contact. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> AJ wants to take a picture with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. See you later. Thank you. All right. Bye. bye.